Hello everybody. Today I'd like to talk to you about synaptic transmission and I'm going to do my best to do some artwork over here and over in this box here I've got some notes for you to copy down about the various steps. Alright so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a couple of neuron endings. One is going to be the presynaptic neuron and I'm going to start drawing that right here so if you could go ahead and draw with me this is my version of the presynaptic terminal. All right, this is the ending, the, the, the knob part of the presynaptic terminal. And this down here is going to be called the postsynaptic terminal. Very rough like that. All right, so this is the presynaptic terminal. That's an A, presynaptic terminal. And this is the postsynaptic terminal. And they're called this because this one comes before and this one comes after a gap here which is called the synapse. So the nerve impulse that is coming down this neuron here at the top has to jump a very small gap called the synapse and land on the postsynaptic terminal and continue down this neuron. So that's the first thing that happens. Well, let's draw AP one. This is the first action potential in this neuron and it's coming down this neuron and it arrives at the presynaptic terminal. So now let's go to the notes and underneath your diagram you can add these notes. Step one. An action potential arrives at the presynaptic terminal. Now inside the presynaptic terminal are membrane-bound structures which are called vesicles and they contain chemicals called neurotransmitters. So this structure here, this is a vesicle. It's something like a vacuole and inside is neurotransmitter and the short form is NT. These are special chemicals that are going to be involved in synaptic transmission. In addition, in the presynaptic terminal membrane, there are channels which allow calcium to enter. And calcium is in high concentration outside of the neuron, outside of the presynaptic terminal. So these channels that I'm indicating right here, these are called voltage-gated calcium channels. And when the action potential arrives, because it's a change of voltage, it opens this channel and it allows calcium to enter the presynaptic terminal. All right, let's go on with the notes. Step two, once the action potential has arrived, voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium enters. So here we can see the calcium going into the presynaptic terminal. Now the calcium is going to help the vesicle with the neurotransmitters move and bind to the presynaptic terminal membrane or fuse with the membrane sort of like a bubble hitting the surface of the water. The bubble bursts and the neurotransmitters are going to fuse with the membrane and burst and they're going to release the neurotransmitters into the synapse. So all these are neurotransmitters in the synapse. Step 3. Calcium helps vesicles containing neurotransmitters 
move to the presynaptic terminal membrane. When a membrane-bound vesicle binds or fuses with the membrane and releases its contents, this is called exocytosis. Exocytosis is the release of chemicals through a membrane by that fusion process. So in step four, vesicles fuse with the membrane and release the neurotransmitters into the synapse by exocytosis. Now we have neurotransmitters in the synapse and they start to diffuse across. And on the other side, at the postsynaptic terminal, there are receptors for those neurotransmitters. And I'm going to draw these as tiny goalposts, like structures, like that. All right. Each of those is a postsynaptic receptor. synaptic receptor and the neurotransmitters will diffuse across and bind to the receptor like that let's go on with the note neurotransmitters diffuse across the synapse and bind to postsynaptic receptors on the postsynaptic terminal In addition to the postsynaptic receptors, there are other gates and channels in the postsynaptic membrane. And I'm going to draw something like this. Okay, with a little gate. There, sprung open. I'm going to draw another one over here, which we'll use in a moment. How that one sprung open as well. What I've just drawn is an ion channel. And because the ion channel is opened when a chemical, a neurotransmitter, binds, these ion channels are chemically gated. They're not voltage gated like the calcium channels. They're chemically gated. In other words, a chemical, the neurotransmitter, controls whether or not they open. So let's go on with the note. Binding of neurotransmitters to receptors, these postsynaptic receptors, causes opening of ion channels in the postsynaptic terminal. I see I've got a bit of a spelling mistake there. These ion channels are chemically gated. Now, in the synapse, there is a high concentration of sodium ions all right we've seen that before outside of the neuron there's high sodium inside's high potassium and some of these ion channels are specific for sodium so when the neurotransmitter binds sodium enters through the ion channel into the postsynaptic terminal now sodium is a positive ion of course and so when positive ions enter the postsynaptic terminal, they can depolarize it to threshold. So when, if enough positive charge comes in here with the sodium, that can depolarize this neuron to threshold and cause another action potential. And that's how we go from action potential one to action potential two. The signal had to jump this gap. This is electrical, electricity, ions moving same idea charge so is this but this is chemicals let's go on with the note if positive ions such as sodium enter through the channels these ion channels the postsynaptic neuron is depolarized to threshold and an action potential is fired and that action potential travels down the postsynaptic neuron This is called excitatory neurotransmission because the neurotransmitter, which was released due to the first action potential, 
causes excitation so that a second action potential can be fired and continue propagating down this postsynaptic neuron. So it's called excitatory neurotransmission. In the synapse, however, there is also high chloride ions. And different neurotransmitters will bind, causing chloride to come in through its specific ion channel as opposed to sodium. So depending on the neurotransmitter, sodium or chloride could come in. Now chloride, of course, is negatively charged. And if enough chloride comes in, this will hyperpolarize the neuron, making it harder to reach threshold and therefore making it harder to fire an action potential. So the influx of chloride inhibits an action potential, whereas the influx of sodium excites or causes an action potential. Back to the note. If negative ions, i.e. chloride, enter, the postsynaptic neuron is hyperpolarized and an action potential is harder to achieve. This is inhibitory neurotransmission. So there is fine control. It's sort of like there's the accelerator pedal and the brake pedal, and a combination of these will determine whether or not this next neuron fires. So there's that fine control there. If you excite a neuron, then something's going to happen. Maybe it's going to land on a muscle and excite it. If you inhibit the neuron, maybe you're going to inhibit or relax a muscle, that kind of thing. Now, the neurotransmitter has done its job. Ions have entered. The neurotransmitter will then fall off, and a few different things can happen. The neurotransmitter can just diffuse away. in which case it's done its job and there's nothing more going on. It can be broken down by enzymes, in which case it's now dysfunctional. Or the neurotransmitter can be reuptaken into the presynaptic terminal for reuse. It's being recycled. This is called reuptake. And any of these three processes can occur now to finalize the process of synaptic transmission. So in step nine, neurotransmitters detach from receptors and may diffuse away. That's point A, so I'll put an A there. They may be broken down by enzymes, point B, or they may be reuptaken into the presynaptic terminal for reuse, point C. Now that is one messy looking diagram. I hope yours looks better. Anyways, I hope you learned something. Thanks for watching.